All right, there you are. Good evening. It is Wednesday, May 19th, 2021. This is our Bible study on the book of Hebrews. And tonight we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11. So if you want to follow along at home in your own Bible, uh, grab your Bible, turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Although I'll have it up here on the screen for you in a moment as well. Um, We're picking up Really, with the the end of chapter 10, there's some argument as to whether or not that le- it belongs with the rest of chapter 10, or it's, if it's really just a lead-in into chapter 11, chapter 11 being the most famous part of the book of Hebrews. All right, one more uh, housekeeping matter before we get started. The uh, Bible study in the book of Hebrews, let's see, we're going to do chapter 11 tonight. Uh, hopefully, we get through most of it, if not all of it. Well, the first part of it, uh, we'll do the I think we'll do the end of the chapter next week. Uh, And then what we're going to do is we're going to move this Bible study to Sunday morning, all right, for the, for the summer. And we'll, you know, be hit or miss in the summer um, because it'll be some vacation days and that kind of sort of thing. Um, But that way uh, I won't have catechesis on Wednesday evenings and I, and I won't have Bible study on Wednesday evening through the summer months, uh, just to give me a little bit of a a break before we hit the ground running again in September, uh, August, September with the, the school and whatnot. All right. So that's the plan. Um, so make plans to join us again next Wednesday evening. Uh, and then, uh, moving forward, just join us on Sunday morning. All right. And hopefully that keeps working as it has been. So let's uh, get the text up on the screen that we're going to consider tonight. And, um, let's see, where did we leave off? We read the end of this, but this is what we'll start with. All right, good. Let's begin with prayer first. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your many blessings, especially the blessings of uh, the examples of faith that we have in the scriptures. That is what we call the Old Testament. By their example, we see how you work faith in their hearts, um, despite their own character and their own shortcomings. Um, You keep them in the faith that is the faith of Jesus Christ. You set their hearts upon uh, the reception of the forgiveness of sins which we now know comes through Jesus and Jesus alone. We ask that you would increase this sort of faith amongst us as well, that we would be examples to our friends and family and those who will come after us um, in the same way that these saints are for us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I got to move the chat window so I can see you. If you've got any chats, I see Don and Eileen and uh, Gus and maybe Karen, they're all here. Don says he's there. I don't. He, now he has to tell me if <laughs> if Karen's with him or not. Because Eileen always lets me know Gus is there. Oh, all right, good. Well, that's fine. We have a little group tonight. That's good. Uh, and again, any questions, um, just throw them into the chat, uh, whether you're on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, or even on Periscope, which I thought was supposed to be shut down, but it's still working, so, so it is. Oh, and by the way, I can see out my window. I can see the church out my window. Now you say, can't you always see the church out your window? No, I can always see the cemetery out my window, but I can't see the church. And now I feel like I need to rearrange my office so that I can see the church while I'm working right out my window because the extraordinarily outrageously overgrown bush that was right by my window is now gone. <laughs> All right, just John, uh, just Don. Good to have you, Don. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked. I have a lot more light in the room now, too. So there you go. All right. Um, So uh, this is where we left off, just to pick up where we left off. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. All right, so running the race with endurance, think St. Paul on that, right? And that's the example of the saints, the people of faith, which we're going to look at for yet a little while. Um, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. All right. So that's from, uh, where is that from? What are we quoting here? And now the just shall live by faith. Oh, yes. This is Habakkuk chapter two, verses three and four. Shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Ooh, the just shall live by faith. So in particular right there, that, that expression, we're going to see examples of the just living by faith in the whole uh, next chapter. All right. So that's the point. That's why I say, is it, is, does it belong with what comes before or it belong with what comes after? How about 
we go and say it belongs with both. <laughs> it leads us from what was being said, you know, watch out lest you fall, right, to what comes. Look, look at how God, by the Spirit, preserves the faith um, of the believers in times of old. All right, but we are not of those who draw back to perdition, right, to destruction, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul, right? So there's your encouragement. Yes, it is possible. I'll scroll back even further. Um, about uh, the judgment. Yeah, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, right? Or this part of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and counted um, the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace, right? So there's that, that harsh warning, right? But notice again, after the harsh warning, I'm scrolling fast, sorry. Uh, we are not of those of the perdition, of the destruction, but those who believe to the saving of the soul, like those we're going to see in the next chapter. All right, my connection there dropped for a minute. Uh, so, lovely internet. All right, okay. We'll just assume that it comes back. Um, so let's read and i'm going to read uh, 31 verses i'm not going to scroll i'm just going to keep reading and then we'll go back and and we'll consider it uh let me see there is one other person in the building who may be taking our internet so i'm going to tell that person they can't have very much internet <laughs> okay in hopes that that will help all right for your sake so just listen now faith is the basis of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. For because of this kind of faith, the people of old were attested by God. By faith we perceive that the worlds have been outfitted by God's spoken utterance, so that what is seen has come to be from things that are invisible. By faith Abel offered a sacrifice of greater value to God than Cain, through which he was attested as righteous, for God bears witness about his gifts. And so through this, even though he has died, he still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken up, so that he did not see death. And he was not to be found, because God had taken him up. For before he was taken up, he had, a, had has attestation that he is well-pleasing to God. Now, without faith, it is impossible to be well-pleasing to him, for anyone who comes near to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith Noah, having been instructed by an oracle about events that were not yet seen, acting with proper reverence, built an ark for the salvation of his household, the, through which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that is based on faith. By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he would receive as an inheritance, and so he set out, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he, was, he made his home in the promised land, as in a foreign land, residing in tents with Isaac and Jacob, who were fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith he also, when he was with infertile Sarah, received power for procreation, even past the normal age, since he reckoned that he who had promised was faithful. So also from one man who was indeed as good as dead, we were begotten as many as the stars of the sky in number and as innumerable as sand along the seashore. In faith all these died, without obtaining the things that were promised. But seeing and welcoming them from afar and confessing that they were foreigners and temporary residents on earth, for those speak like this show that they diligently were diligently seeking a homeland. And if, on the one hand, they were remembering the one which they had left, they would have had an opportunity to return. But on the other hand, they now long for a better homeland, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered Isaac. 
So he who had received the promises was ready to offer his only begotten son, about whom it had been spoken that through Isaac your seed will be called. Since he considered that God had the power to raise even from the dead, hence he regained him also as a parabolic enactment. By faith Isaac also blessed Jacob and Esau with regard to the things to come. By faith Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's sons and bowed down over the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, as he was coming to his end, mentioned the exodus of the Israelites and gave commands about his bones. By faith Moses, after he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that he was a well-formed child and were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith Moses, when he was grown up, renounced being called a son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing to be mistreated with the people of God rather than have a fleeting enjoyment of sin, reckoning that the mockery of, of the Messiah was greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. For he was looking for the payment of a reward. By faith he left Egypt, unafraid of the king's anger, for as one who kept seeing the unseen wood, he stood firm. By faith he performed the Passover with the pouring of the blood, so that the one who destroyed the firstborns would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, whereas the Egyptians, when they made an attempt of it, or at it, were swallowed up. By faith the walls of Jericho that had been encircled for seven days fell down. And by faith Rahab the prostitute was not destroyed with the faithless, because she welcomed the spies in peace. All right. All right, and now it's reconnected. Um, and let's see here. Let's check and see if it's now going out over the better connection. And destination. Yes, okay, that should be better. <laughs> much better. Much, 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 much better. All right, thanks for your patience here while I was. Uh, tweaking it out. I guess I just had to disconnect and reconnect to make it work. All right. Uh, because it, it was going out over the cellular uh, connection, which is not correct. Okay. Um, <laughs> of course, there. it just dropped down in quality again. Once I said that. Insane. Insane. I should have kept my mouth shut. Oh, well. All right. Um, so again, it begins with a proverb, uh, verses 1 and 2. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony, right? Uh, and that's, that's the setup for the whole, this whole part of the chapter. It's, it's really a long catalog, long um, catalog, I would say, of the people of faith. Um, but isn't it interesting that it doesn't start with Adam? It actually starts with the members of the congregation. That's you, right? We understand and, and it starts at creation. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which were seen uh, were not made of things which are visible. All right. And then there's, um, if you break it down, 17 examples of faith. And it's from five stages of the uh, foundational story of God's people. So we, we're going to start with um, Cain and Abel, then we go to Abraham, and it goes through all the way until... Um, Rahab of all people, which is kind of curious, isn't it? All right. Um, so, and then each of those stages are arranged, I'd say pretty carefully. Um, and the way it's broken down is that the first three are, we'll say types of Christ, the first three examples. And then we have four examples um, from the life of Moses as a type of Christ, three cases from the Exodus um, journey as types of deliverance, uh, no, excuse me. Oh, I missed Abraham. Three cases. Oh, I skipped it. Okay, how does it go? I'm looking at uh, the breakdown here. Three cases, you know, early ones that are types of Christ. So we have um, Abel and, uh, of course, Noah and Enoch. Enoch and Noah. All right, those three. Then we have four examples from the life of Abraham. Abraham. All right. And then um, we have three cases from other patriarchs after Abraham. 
Then we have four cases from the life of Moses as examples of Christ. And then we have three cases um, from the wilderness journey, the Exodus journey, um, as types of deliverance. All right, so the two exemplary men are Abraham and Moses. Of course, you can think of the scriptures. I mean, that, that makes sense. Um, they, they take up a bulk of the Old Testament, I suppose. Um, Abel is the first, that, uh, the first non-Hebrew example of faith, right? Because he's right at the beginning of creation before the Hebrew nation. And of course, Rahab is also the non-Hebrew example of faith at the end. So it begins and ends with a non-Hebrew. Ah, oh, that's curious, isn't it? Um, so the first one, of course, is that uh, uh, Abel has to do with the right offering toward uh, to God, and then uh, Rahab is saved, um, is a representation of, of faith that saves um, all believers from destruction and God's judgment. All right, so sacrifice and judgment. Um, so within each, within each of these ex- seventeen examples are, what do you want to say? Um, acts of faith, right? And within the acts, they give the reason for the act, right? So why they do what they do, its purpose, um, for for what purpose, for what gain, and then what's the result, right? So we have, they give a reason and its purpose and its result. Um, the the most profound of that or good example of that was in verse eleven. No, 13, excuse me, here. These all, right, this whole section, 13 to 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth, right? So that's a summary of everybody up to that point, right? That's the reason. Um, and then uh, what was the, uh, the purpose? For the, those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. The purpose is a, is a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from out of which they had, they had come out, they would have had an opportunity to return, right? But now they desire, here's the purpose, right? And the result, for now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. There's the result, all right? So there's a notable example. But we have that in even smaller ways before that all right and then um let's see what else do we want to talk about before we dig into these um well the word faith occurs a few times if you didn't catch that um by faith is 18 times and then related phrases like uh, that is based on faith without faith in faith um, are in there as well um there is a chronological um ordering to this it does follow the history of the old testament i think this is important to note um that the preacher teacher to the to the hebrews presumes that you know your bible right he's not going to tell the whole story um but he just keeps jump pointing out examples but does it with such flourish uh, it's really impressive isn't it again abel enoch noah four examples from abraham isaac jacob and joseph then four examples from moses and then the israelites two of those and then rahab pretty impressive right um, did he just come off of this with the top of his head or did he prepare it? <laughs> that is a question, is it not? Yeah. So, the, I mean, there is this uh, presumption that the first six books of the Bible, um, that is Genesis, Mo- uh, the Torah, the books of Moses, and then also the book of Joshua would be familiar to you, right? Um, and that you don't have to, I don't have to go through and tell you who all these people are because you know these stories quite well. And, uh, it's probably actually true, right? Um, and actually, then, it's important to remember that that narrative history of the Old Testament is the foundation for our faith, right? Because it prepared us to receive Christ in the same way it prepared them um, to look forward to the Messiah Christ that is to come, right? Um, the second thing that happens over and over in here, and I think this is key when it comes to faith as well, is, the, is uh, either verbs or adjectives for seeing, right? It happened over and over. Seeing... Um, looking forward to, foreseeing, previewing, um, unseen, perceiving, you know, all that kind of language, or even showing, right? So um, different um, words for seeing or cognates or similar, similar kind of ideas, all right? So we, and this is interrelated, right? Not only that you would know the books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua, um, but also um, that you would see through them, Right, this foundational story of Israel gives you insight 
if you prefer, so that you can see into God's vision um, for you, for the congregation, um, ultimately for the heavenly community, as we just looked at uh, in verses 13 through 16. Right? And again, to quote um, St. Peter, or excuse me, St. Paul, you know, to encourage you to run with endurance, right? To give you encouragement so that you can run the race faithfully and persistently, always with your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, who's um, already run the race for you, ahead of you. So you don't even have to run it very well. <laughs> Not to say you don't run it, right? You run with perseverance and with patience and you stay on the path, right? You know, follow the way that Jesus has set before you. On the other hand, he's run it before you, right? He's the trailblazer. Um, so the path is clear. The way has been made safe, actually, for you. All right? Um, much like Moses, who saw him, right? And uh, I like the way that Dr. Klein kind of summarizes the chapter. Now that you've heard the bulk of it, he calls it a rhetorical tour de force, a masterpiece in persuasive speech. It appeals to the congregation imaginatively and emotionally. It's imagin- imaginative appeal stems from its vivid presentation of the story of God's faithful people in the Old Testament as the congregation's own story, the story of its journey from heaven to from earth to heaven, the story of its pilgrimage to the eternal city of God. Yet even though these people of faith are the congregant's spiritual ancestors, they do not just belong to the past as figures from ancient history. Here's the key. They surround the congregation like unseen spectators in the divine service. Remember, this is being preached and taught in the context of a divine service, right? So they're, they're with us in the midst of this. So these people, all these people mentioned how they are by faith. Well, now they have already been received um, into eternity, right? So they're gathered with us around the altar at the sacrament. And they continue to bear witness to God's faithfulness as the congregation hears about them when the scriptures are read and expounded, right? Like Abel, they have not been silenced by death, but continue to speak, right? Abel's blood cried out for vengeance. All right. So let's, uh, let's look at some of these. Oh, maybe there's uh, three things that we... <laughs> there's always something more. Um, again, each of them are going to have an action. And then there's going to be thing that their faith hopes for. And then there's going to be a vision of unseen things that are given by their faith. All right. So we're going to see that with each of them. All right. So again, first it begins with the congregation. That's you. By faith, here we are, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, right? So we can perceive God's invisible work in the world, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible, right? God's created, God created the whole universe by his word, right? We believe that. And maybe there are slight indications to that in the ordering of creation. Um, but faith actually says that that it was God's doing, and that and that that um, the fact that that this is a creation of God that actually requires faith, right? It cannot be proven um, by just mere observation, right? Got it. So our faith is that God made the heavens and the earth and still takes care of them, right? Um, to think of um, Luther and the Catechism, um, but that's not easily demonstrable by the way that creation actually behaves. You know, think of thunder, thunder, lightning, tempest, uh, wind, uh, tornado, hurricane, tsunami, (laughs) okay, earthquakes. These are not uh, evidences of God's good ordering of creation, but rather of the uh, creation's rebellion against God, as a matter of fact. All right, so there's our first example. Then we have Abel. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Prove it. Well, I can't. (laughs) This is an assertion um, of the preacher teacher here by inspiration of the Spirit. Um, Through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and though he being dead, still speaks. All right, so this is beautiful interpretation of the events um, back in Genesis. How do we know that his offering um, was pleasing to God? That was his action of faith? Was that it was accepted by God? Right, and and the scripture testifies to that. Uh, his um, one script, one sacrifice was received, and the other was not. Which here the preacher teacher says that is an indication um, of the faith of the heart. That that uh, Cain did not offer his cereal, his grain offering, uh, in faith. 
Now that is importing um, some meaning into the text, all right? But again, by the by the work of the Spirit. All right. Um, anything else I want to say about Cain and Abel? I suppose that's, you know, it is kind of a, a challenging thing, I suppose. I mean, here, I'll just read you what, um, I'll read you what Dr. Kleinig says about it. I think he does a pretty good job trying to figure it out. How did God, how God did this is not said. He accepted Abel's as righteous. It may have been by taking the column of smoke straight up into the sky or by sending down fire from the sky. The teacher passes over that to focus on the present. For in the divine service, as in a court of law, God bears witness through the scriptures to Abel as a righteous man who by faith presented a right offering to God. So through the gifts that he, by faith, brought to God, Abel still speaks in the divine service. Uh, I'm thinking, Abel's blood for vengeance. Oh, glory be to Jesus, who in bitter pains, right? Poured for me his life blood from his sacred veins. What's the what's the stanza about about Abel? Abel's blood for vengeance. Ah, I went too far. I can never find the index page in this silly book. All right. Oh, uh, glory to you, Jesus. Somebody's going to fill it in before I actually get there, aren't they? I should have known. It's right in the Lent section. Nope, nobody said it yet. Probably can't type as fast as I can read. Abel's blood for vengeance pleaded to the skies, but the blood of Jesus for our pardon cries. Right. I love how the hymn writer does that. Right. Um, so anyway, um, even though he has died, he is the first place in the cloud of witnesses that surround the congregation. He is one of the spirits of the righteous who have been made perfect. The teacher does not say how he speaks. It may be that his faithful offering or by his faithful death because of it, as the first martyr, really, or more, more, most likely by his cry to God for vindication for himself and all other martyrs by being raised from the dead. Even though Abel is not seen by the congregation, he is still heard as he bears witness to Christ. He still speaks. He is the first of many such voices. Uh, of those who, although he, they died long ago, nevertheless hope for eternal life with God. So he pleads for vindication, for vengeance. Right? And what, how does God vindicate the shed blood of Abel? By dying for him. And for Cain. Remember, Cain has the mark put on him. God has mercy on him. Right? So Abel's blood cries out for the sacrificial lamb to forgive the sins of his brother who killed him. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. All right. Um, Enoch. You know that story quite well, right? <laughs> Probably not. Uh, Enoch is in Genesis chapter 4. All right. And Enoch, again, these three people are pictures of Christ. All right. So Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. That's a straight up quote right from Genesis 5. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. All right, so a few things are going on here. Um, so with, with Abel, you know, we have um, the innocent dying and uh, crying out for vengeance, right? Which is with Christ. He, he's the innocent one who dies for the, for the guilty, right? For his brother, in a sense. That's for us. And then we have Enoch, who is a picture of Christ in what way? That he suffers, right? And he, um, he doesn't, well, he doesn't suffer, but he, but he does ascend into heaven, right? I think that's probably the closest thing. Um, he's the seventh named since Adam. You can see the, the sons of Adam uh, named in, in Jude, chapter four, or verse 14. Um, it, but he's the only man whose death is not mentioned in the scriptures. You can see that in Genesis 5. I suppose we could look at that because it's probably one of the least fa uh, familiar of these stories. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch, and after he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God. That simply means that he listened to God's word, <laughs> untrusted in it, 300 years, and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not for God took him. All right, and that's it. That's all we've got. And from that, 
we have this really incredible confession here and was not found because God had taken him. Um, You see how here it's quoting from the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament. It doesn't say how um, God took him, um, but only why God treated him in this singular fashion. He was taken up into heaven because he walked with God for 300 years before his assumption. All right. So his exemplary character um, is that he lived by faith, that he walked with God. He lived by the word of God. Um, So this is contrast, of course, from to those who would shrink back from the word of Christ back in chapter 10. All right? And his reward, of course, is that he was assumed into heaven. Of course, this is a picture of Christ too, right? Who did the work that the Father gave him. He walked in the way that he was, was set before him, even though it meant his suffering and death. And then he was ascended and exalted into the heavens as well. All right. So there's Enoch. Now, uh, Noah would be the third example of the primordial, the primeval um, examples, that is the ones before the flood. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, preparing an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Um, So there's two things that we might want to say here. Um, I mean, obviously, he lived by faith because he had to take God at his word in building the ark, of course, right? Um, to do what God had given. And by that, God would save his household, right? But at the same time, he would condemn the world. So what's interesting, I think, here with um, with Noah is that we have um, God's um, word, rightly divided, but, you know, law and gospel, right? We have the salvation of his people, that is, of his family, eight souls in all, the righteousness, which is, which is according to faith, right? I'm an heir of the world, but also... Um, the accusation and really the condemnation of the world and the sentence uh, for unbelief, for unrighteousness. All right. So we get a little bit of both there. All right. And then we're going to get three examples of um, faith from the life of Abraham. And he's a prototypical man of faith, if you like. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to the place where he would receive his inheritance. Remember? Uh, Abraham was called from unbelief to, to faith. He uh, is called from the land of Ur of the Chaldeans, right? Um, to what we now know, and know as Israel, the promised land, Canaan, right? And he went out not knowing where he was going. God simply said, go, right? And he did it. Um, all right, so that's the first example. The second example, which builds on the previous one, is that then he goes and he dwells in a land of promise but it's a but he's a resident alien, if you like. I know we're not supposed to use that terminology anymore. Illegal alien, right? He's a resident alien in the promised land. So he he actually lives a paradoxical life. Now there's a paradox here, um, a conflict. It's the land God promised to him, but he doesn't actually belong there. Hmm. How's that for interesting? Um, but doesn't that kind of describe the Christian life? I'm but a stranger here. Heaven is my home. I've criticized that hymn frequently, but um, there is a truth to it, of course, as well. Um, there, some people lo- love this life more than the life to come, right? And that's why they would neglect faith, right? The trust in Jesus, looking forward to um, the salvation of, of all mankind on the last day, the resurrection and the life everlasting, right? So we, whoever desires to um, save his life must lose his life, Jesus says, right? Whoever loves his life in this world will will lose it in eternity right so um, there is that mm, that warning against um seeing the the temporal the the things of now of this world um, at the disadvantage of the things to come all right so that's what's going on there um dwelling um in tents right residing in tents rather than permanent houses right which is another way of demonstrating um that kind of foreignness of it Right, looking forward to the unseen, hoped-for place that God would eventually pro- provide for him in full fulfillment of the promise. All right, more than just a, a tent on a piece of farmland, um, something far more permanent, but um, a city that has its foundations, uh, which has foundations, actually, as he says here, whose builder and maker is God. Right, heirs with him of the same promise. Right, of course, this is uh, where Saint Augustine gets the famous. Uh, his famous, you know, two cities, um, the city of God, right? 
is his famous work, the last, really, is, is magnum opus, right? And that's what we're looking forward to. Not the, all the facsimiles of this heavenly city that we have on this earth, which are frankly just terrible. Um, I was just lamenting with Marla. She worked in uh, Milwaukee. I worked in Chicago um, in church. And uh, in both cases, uh, we had negative experiences of what it's like to live in the city. Um, no offense to those of you who have chosen to dwell in cities, but uh, um, they're all poor copies of the heavenly city that is to come. All right, so let's be clear about that. I'm oh, sorry, I scrolled. I didn't mean to there. All right. Anything else we should say about that? Yeah. I mean, in the, in ancient, in the ancient world, cities were the most secure place, right? I know um, my congregation, we're, we're really urban, not urban people at all. We're pretty rural people, but I mean, we live in Random Lake. It's a little village. It's a little city. Um, we call it a village. Um, and uh, there's some beauty to that, too, where we, we're around each other and we care for each other. Um, and it's probably more secure than as being out alone, um, especially as the marauding hordes come through um, looking for food and, you know, in the year to come as a, there's a major food shortage. Oh, did I just say that out loud? I did. Why would there be a major food shortage? Oh, are you talking about manipulation of the food supply by the USDA? Yes, I am. <laughs> Go look it up. All right. Um, so yeah, he's looking for a, a, a better city. Why? Because this city is going to be made and built by God, right? Isn't that beautiful? You think of like, and uh, don't you know that uh, uh, in my in my house there are many rooms, right? Or uh, I go to prepare a place for you. God's or Jesus says. All right, all right. So there's uh, your f second example, I should say, from Abraham. Now the third example. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, which may be a little confusing because usually we refer to the, the male contribution to conception as the seed, but here, um, yeah, there's some argument. Maybe uh, they don't have a, quite the same understanding of biology that we do, uh, lacking, uh, what do you want to say, a full uh, understanding. Um, but I think it's something more than that. We'll talk about that in a second. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. All right. I think what's going on here, talking about her seed, is the promise made to Eve, right? By your seed, by your offspring, as it's named, by your seed, um, you know, he will crush the serpent's head, right? Um, and so here it's attached to Sarah, you know, because it's attached to the woman. Um, I guess you could view the egg as a seed, right? And then it's fertilized. Um, but usually we refer to the, the male contribution as being the seed. But uh, regardless, I don't know if you want to make too much about that. Either way, um, she was barren and Abraham was good as dead. It says, um, in, uh, well, right here in 12. We haven't read that part. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead. In other words, he's got no life coming out of him. We're born as many as the stars of the sky and multitude innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. So there's a repetition um, of the... Oh, I didn't mean to highlight all that. Ah, silly man, why'd you do that? Uh, how do I unhighlight it? Okay, there we go. Um, this is a quote from Genesis 15, Genesis 22, Genesis 32, right? Uh, three times Abraham gets that promise. Um, but he's as good as dead. Uh, and she is barren, um, but they trust, regardless of what they, they could not see, right? Remember, this is faith. So faith is the thing, the substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Um, I think this is really beautiful, too, um, that she received the power of procreation. <laughs> the power of procreation. God, um, that word here is, is dunamis, right? Dynamite. The <laughs> you don't think about a child being conceived as being dynamite. Oh, I suppose. If you're a married couple, you can understand that a little bit. <laughs> I'll keep my mouth shut. I had more things that would be probably uh, <laughs> inappropriate. Okay, uh, because she had judged him faithful who had promised, right? So there's the key. What does faith say? God is faithful to his promises, uh, even when we're not faithful to him. Was she always faithful? Not so much. She laughed, remember? What's the child's name? Isaac because she laughed. She laughed. We're, 
Um, also, what's cool here is that um, the word is going to conceive out of death, right? He's as good as dead, and yet life is going to come out of death, which is a lovely picture of what Christ does, right? Bringing resurrection of the body and life everlasting um, out of death, out of death. And of course, the multitudes that descend from Sarah, are they just Jews? No, of course not. It's the whole Christian congregation, Jewish and non-Jewish, children of Abraham and Sarah and co-heirs with them by faith. All right. Um, and there you can quote, uh, what, Galatians uh, 5, I believe it is, right? We're all children of Abraham by faith. That is, we have the same faith that he had. But here it's Sarah. All right, so there's example three. Um, and now there's going to be an expansion on what we just heard about, those three examples, before we get the fourth example. These all, so we're thinking, again, Abel, Enoch, and um, Noah and now Abraham and Sarah, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar, were assured of them, right? It's a far distant shore, but God kept promising to them, and they trusted in his promise, despite not receiving it face to face. Confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth, right? So moving towards the things that are promised. Um, so, I mean, imagine at times, one of the things that uh, the, the the expansion here is happening from the preacher teacher is to show us that um, experience doesn't always confirm um, the truth, right? We don't often experience the things that God promises for us, even though the promise is still true. And we may not experience it until the resurrection, right? So it's, a, it's again, it's the things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen, right? They all died without obtaining the things that they hoped for, right? So think Abraham um, was promised a, you know, a promised land, Canaan. But the one that he got was only, well, he was a foreigner there, really, right? And actually, they ended up being exiled away from it. Um, did he see all the children that God had promised him, as numerous as this? No, of course he didn't see that. Um, you know, they're, so they're, they're like travelers in sight of their destination, and, but yet they can see it, and yet they can't quite get there, right? Um, and I think this is helpful just to remember um, that we, ho- we receive everything in this life and in this world um, with the hands of with faith. And Luther describes the hands of faith like this. They're loose, right? Not like this, right? We don't grab onto the things of this world, but we hold them loosely and they often slip through our fingers, right? But think about Jesus' own language of, um, uh, with, the, with the Syrophoenician woman, right? Where she says, yes, even, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that slip through the master's fingers from the table, if you like. All right? So, yeah, we don't, don't hold on to anything that tightly. Does it ultimately make you not that happy? Um, do hold on to your cryptocurrency, because, uh, of course, it's gonna, it'll bounce back and it'll be bigger than it was before. Hold. I don't think any of you have cryptocurrency. Okay. Uh, which is just fake money, just like the U.S. dollar which is also fake money because it has no backing in reality. Neither does cryptocurrency. It's all made up. It's all play money. It's all monopoly money if you prefer. All right. And that's the problem. If you treat it as something more than that, um, you will ultimately become dissatisfied and be led into all sorts of evil. The love of money is, of course, the root of such things. Uh, moving along, for those who say such things, declare them plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, to see what faith does, is it gives a new hope, a new desire. Now, don't go back to where we were. Oh, by the way, who are the unfaithful pilgrims in the days of Moses? Yeah, all those who said, let's go back to Egypt. <laughs> <laughs> rather than looking forward to the land that God had promised them. Make sense? Therefore, um, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So there, you can see how this whole section is an expansion of what we had right before that. All right, I think I'm the only one left here on campus, so we can return the internet to its proper settings. Okay. Oh, uh, let's see. Anything else we want to talk about? No. Well, maybe. Mm-hmm. 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 Uh, oh, I did want to share something with you from Dr. Kleinig about land ownership in the ancient world. All right, I'm just going to read what he has to say here. The full force of the imagery in verses 13 to 16, which we just read, 
can be gauged only if we appreciate the importance of land ownership in the ancient world. Land which was owned by extended families was passed down within the family. That still happens in rural communities, right? Farms. Um, sons inherited their fatherland, literally, fatherland, right? The hereditary estate of their families from their fathers. With the ownership of land came much more than a secure livelihood, for it brought with it personal identity, social status, cultural heritage, legal protection, religious privileges, and political clout. By the way, if 150 of us can get together and we own our own land and it's adjacent to each other, um, we, can, um, we can actually, what's the opposite of annexing? Um, to break off, we can form our own town. Yes, that's right. All that's required in most states is 150 people that own their own land and the land is contiguous, right? It's continuous, connected to each other. And you can form your own town. So we should form the town of Sherman Center. We can make our own town. We just have to all move to Sherman Center. Okay. <laughs> so we can get 150 people here. Oh, because I don't think we're there now. No, that my family actually is, a, what, 10% of that almost, right? <laughs> so <laughs> wouldn't take that many of us. Uh, what were we talking about? Oh, yes. Um, again, sons inherited their fatherland, the hereditary estate from their, of their families from their fathers. It brought a secure livelihood personal identity, social status, cultural heritage, legal protection, religious privileges, and political clout. Landless people lacked all that, right? And this will help you understand what's going on in Israel, of course. All right, now. The most vulnerable people of all were foreigners who lived in a country as temporary residents. They lived from hand to mouth and eked out a precarious existence on the margins of society. This is like being a Palestinian, uh, or being a Jew in Palestine, actually, in, uh, in uh, the Gaza Strip, for example. It would be like this. If you're actually a Palestinian in Israel, it's actually pretty good for you because they're a very liberal country relative to, uh, to the Gaza Strip, to Palestine, which is uh, extremely, extremely uh, strict. Uh, mostly Muslim, of course. The most vulnerable people of all were foreigners who lived in a country of, as temporary residents. They lived hand to mouth and eked out a precarious existence on the margins of society, utterly dependent as they were on the goodwill, protection, and patronage of the landowners. Since they had no secure place in an agricultural community, they tended to live in towns and cities where there was some demand for their services. The best of these were royal cities, where royal patronage gave them a measure of legal protection and a relatively secure livelihood as a reward for loyal service. Yet ultimately their security depended on their links with their original homeland and the possibility of their return there, if they lost their foothold in the foreign country. Unlike them, the patriarchs founded their security in an unseen future homeland, which gave them their identity, status, wealth, and protection. Such was their faith. All right, so maybe I need to repeat that. The patriarchs founded their security in an unseen future homeland, which gave them their identity, status, wealth, and protection. Right? And we do the same thing. Our identity, we're Christians, right? Um, heaven is our home. Our status is that we're actually royalty, sons and daughters of the king, right? That we have a great treasure, which of course is Christ's forgiveness and all the gifts of the church, right? And we're, we're protected. Um, yes, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, but he cannot devour us, right? Because we've been armed, we've been protected, and the angels, um, as well as, the, well, the angels especially, have been sent to, to guard and, and to have charge over us, to watch out for us, all right? So what do we got to worry about? Uh, except we don't see it and we don't experience it on the large part. It's all received by faith. Okay, so that's that expansion here, verse 13 to 16. I think that's really beautiful. And I like the way Dr. Kleinig expanded this. I, you know, why this would be so important for those hearing to recognize um, that we do look forward to all being landowners, if you like, in the kingdom of heaven. That is in heaven itself. All right, and then one more example um, from Abraham, right? For and that is, um, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, right? That famous story from, um, where's that? Genesis 25, I think, isn't it? 22, Genesis 22. Offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Hmm, only begotten son. I wonder if that's coincidental language. I don't think so, right? You see Isaac being a type of Christ there, of Jesus. Of whom it is said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. 
here it is, again, interpretive, just like what we saw with Cain and Abel. So here, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. All right. Um, So uh, this is clear. I mean, Paul does the same thing in Romans 4 uh, when he says, Um, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Right? So, uh, and you can actually see this in the story in Genesis 22. He says to, um, Abraham says to his servants, uh, we will return to you. We, plural, Isaac and I, even though he's going to sacrifice his son. Right? So the writer of the Hebrews really summarizes it well to say, um, God will provide for himself the sacrifice, my son. Right? Abraham says that. Is that going to be Isaac? At that point, yes. That's what he believes. And yet he does believe that God will restore his son to him. Why? Again, for the sake of the promise. God made a promise. So even if God makes a promise and he also commands something that seems to utterly contradict it, what do we do? We trust, right? We follow the contradiction knowing that the promise still holds true, even in the midst of the contradiction, right? And now this is really important when it comes to faith, I think, um, in understanding I don't know, something like um, the way that our experience in this world is often seems to be contradictory to the promises of God. God says, I promise to love you, I'll protect you, I'll keep you safe. And then we experience temptation, trial, suffering in the body, suffering um, in this world. And we watch uh, this country, which our Lord has blessed us with, fall into disrepair, well, and really into chaos um, politically. Um, and change is happening in a way that um, um, seems. Well, it doesn't even seem to make any sense. Um, how could rational or sensible people um, do the things that they're doing, right? Well, we know that's how the devil works. But here's the key. We know that God will preserve us. He'll care for us as Christians. Uh, we know that um, the devil thinks um, that his chaos and disorder that he sows um, will only bring death and destruction. Um, but we actually believe, by faith again, that all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose, that God uses even suffering, pain, disaster, um, the collapse of, of an empire or of a country. He uses all of that for our benefit and for the benefit of faith that we trust in him and not in this life, in this world, in this country, in our job, um, in our property, our possessions, even in our congregation, right? That we trust in his word, in his word alone, right? So that's the key, I think. And we don't want to lose sight of that because that, um, that's when we get into bad, uh, that's, well, that's when we would fall into uh, territory that would not be helpful. That would be unbelief. All right. How are we doing on time? Oh, it's right at eight o'clock. All right. Um, so we, oh, I didn't get through the whole book. I thought we'd get through the whole, that whole section, but here I am talking. So uh, we went all the way through verse 17. Okay, well, uh, no, we didn't go through 17. Oh, we got up to 20. All right, well, we'll pick up with verse 20 then next time, and we'll start with eight, Isaac. So we did, again, uh, just to summarize here, what did we cover? I'm looking at, uh, i find a chart here. That'll help me summarize. Dun, 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 Sorry. There it is. All right, so we did the congregation, right? They're the faithful actors. Right, their action of faith is a perception of God's invisible work, and what do they see by faith? That God created the universe by His word. Right, that was the first one. Abel makes an offering to God. Right, and and what is he? What is his faith hope for? Acceptance by God. And of course, his faith was accepted by God, or his sacrifice was accepted. Enoch, the action of faith is he walked with God. Right, he lived a God pleasing life. Right, and what what did he what did he see? Escape from death by translation into heaven. Right that we walk with God and he leads us in um, to eternal life. Noah, build the ark, right? And what, what does he hope for? The salvation of his family, right? That they be saved. And what does he see? By faith, the coming flood is God's judgment on the world, right? Even before it happens. Abraham first uh, is called to journey in obedience, right? To a promised land, right? And what does he hope for? The inheritance that God promises, right? Um. And then the action of faith is to live there temporarily, right? Rather than put down roots, he lives there in tents. Why? Because he's looking forward to the city of God, the thing that is unseen, right? He's hoping for that permanent residence in the city of God, which we still hope for. 
Um, then we had Abraham and Sarah, right? Uh, what was the action of faith? Well, they continued to work to conceive a son, <laughs> right? Why? Because God has promised, again, that heavenly homeland and city, that would be a city full of, of dwelling people. And what do they hope for? Many descendants, a large family, all right? And then finally, we had Abraham with the sacrifice of Isaac, right? That's the action of faith. Um, what, what does he hope for? That his son will be restored to him, right? Resurrected, right? But what is it seeing forward to? What's the unseen thing that yet he does not yet know? Um, he only receives in a figurative way in this life, right? In a figurative sense, but will receive fully on the last day the resurrection of the body, right? The resurrection of all the dead, all right? So beautiful. You see how faith, again, um, uh, compels one to action. It looks forward to things that we cannot see, but we know and we believe. Um, and also, um, it also uh, sometimes, quite often, here you see in these examples, receives um, some kind of temporal benefit too, an earthly benefit. Salvation, acceptance by God, um, even a temporary residence, descendants, a large family, um, or even your son received back to you, right? In the case of Isaac. All right, so there's your little summary. Uh, we'll do more on this next time. I guess I should have recognized we weren't going to get that far. Uh, we'll jump in with Isaac on verse 20. All right, sorry for the internet glitches there in the middle. That delayed us a little bit, but that's okay. Um, and uh, hopefully, yeah, it worked better after that. It's been working brilliantly since then. So uh, don't know how that happened. It wasn't supposed to happen. So Lord be with you all. Keep you safe, and we'll see you again. Uh, in the morning for Congregation Prayer at 9 a.m. Lord be with you all.